Hello, everyone. Welcome back from break. Welcome back online. Raising up the remnant 2019. Thank you for joining us this morning. We had a, a few technical difficulties trying to connect online, so we would just like to let everyone live streaming know we're online now. We are. We're not going to try and uh, have any more issues like that. So we're glad you're with us, and um, refresh your browser if you notice any lag time. All right, well, I would like to introduce our next speaker. He's a financial coach. He was trained and designated by Dave Ramsey, and he has some wonderful things to share with us um, from a biblical standpoint on finances. Brennan Falks. Thank you. How are you guys doing today? Good, good morning, good to see you all. Um, so we're gonna be talking about biblical financial wisdom Give it a second to pop up here. Can you guys see that okay? All right. Um, we are, as you guys know, we're in exile, right? We have woken up to the truth. We found out that we've inherited a lot of lies over time, and we need to figure out how to function in exile while having the truth at the same time, kind of a living in the world but not being of it. So I'm going to kind of walk through how we're going to do that. So why finances? Why, why am I talking to you about personal finance? A little bit about me. I come from a mostly single parent home. My mom raised me and my brother almost by herself. We had a stepdad come and go. Um, wasn't much of a dad or a man, but that's just what the situation was. And so throughout that time, my mom struggled a lot to provide for me and my brother, even with the little bit of child support she got. And it was not that she didn't make enough money because oftentimes she would work three jobs at a time to provide. Um, what was really going on, looking back in hindsight, she didn't know how to manage the money she was making. And so I've always been a saver. I don't know, you know, there's, I'm of the opinion that you're either one of two ways. You're either a saver or a spender. Neither one of you is wrong, neither one is bad. It's just how you handle your money. So I've always been more of a saver. And because of that, um, I, I was taught a little bit of save your money, but because I was so into saving my money, I was also taught I need to build my credit score, get into debt, go to college, all that type of stuff that we're all probably taught by corporate America, mainstream giants, you know, even our parents. And it just never sat right with me. So I thought, well, I, I really don't want to do that. I'd rather save my money and, and figure out a different way. Because of the difficult situation that I lived through as a teenager, there was times that I would have to pay bills because my mom couldn't pay them. Um, I know people have had it worse, I'm not up here to complain or anything, but that's just part of you know, what led me into personal finance. So then when I got married to my wife, we decided we're not gonna, we're not gonna let finance, personal finance be a area of contention or tension in our marriage. And it turns out that in America, the number one cause of stress in marriage is due to personal finance. And so we thought, what can we do to get educated? How can we follow the scriptures and what they have to say about personal finance and apply that to our lives today? So that's what we did. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. Uh, this is a, from a movie clip. I've never seen the movie. I've just seen the clip floating around on social media. This man is walking around, and he's, you know, he's had just his own eyes for his whole life, and he sees a bunch of billboards, and he gets this pair of glasses, and as he's walking down the street, he sees a billboard, like right here, it says freedom. So in the movie, let's say, for example, it's a Coca-Cola billboard. And when he puts the glasses on, he sees the truth and it says something more like consume. And so the, the big question of this conference of the weekend is we've come into truth, now what? Now what are we gonna do? What do we do with the information? How do we apply it? How do we live it? Because it's not just about the head knowledge, right? It's about the behaviors behind the head knowledge. And so um, the now what is ready, set, change. Just like that, right? But it's never that easy. We have the power to change. We have control to choose. The Father has given us the ability to, to choose. The way that we change is right here. It's a very simple concept, but it's not easy. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. That's the solution right there. So we're talking about biblical financial wisdom. Some of you may have heard of some of the stuff I talk about or others before me. Um, you may or may not be surprised to know that there's financial wisdom within the Bible, even financial wisdom that can be applied to our modern situation today. 
We're going to go over some basics, the three main uses for money. Very simple. We're going to keep it as simple as possible. It's not going to be something that's boring and you know math nerd status or anything like that. Saving, spending, giving. That's what we do with money. Some examples of reasons to save. We want to save for emergencies. We want to save to make purchases. And we want to save to invest. Um, saving for an emergency is going to be something that helps keep you out of debt in your future. So. What would, cut, what would be a legitimate emergency is not something like, I need a new big screen TV. We're not going to go into the emergency savings for that. What would be an emergency is we have a medical situation, we have to go to the hospital and we have to meet our deductible or else insurance doesn't cover anything. Medical uh, debt is the number one reason that people file bankruptcy in this, in this country. That's often because they can't meet deductibles or they're not adequate, adequately insured. Saving for purchases it looks like Delayed gratification, we're going to wait until we can afford something before we buy it. We're not just going to go impulse buy something, we're going to sleep on it, take a cold shower if we have something like car fever, okay? Um, saving for investing is going to be for our future, uh, leaving an inheritance to our children, their children, etc. That may or may not happen in the future. You may or may not have everything that you've worked so hard to have because who knows when the father's returning and what his, his plan is. But we're going to do the best with what we've been given by the Father. Genesis 41, 34 through 36. Everyone's familiar with this. Um, I'm not going to read it, but this is where the Pharaoh uh, has his dreams. Joseph is given the wisdom to interpret the dreams, and Joseph advises Pharaoh to take a fifth of the surplus that they're going to have for the next seven years and store it away. So Joseph is given insight from the Father. He's given a vision from the Father to know that disaster's coming. You need to be prepared for it. We may not have a direct revelation, a divine revelation from the Father, but we do know that rainy days happen. People say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's negative. It's not negative, it's positive. I'm positive it's gonna rain. It's going to rain, we need to prepare, <laughs> right? It's gonna happen, so. Uh, Luke 14, 28. This is, uh, how, this is an example that we can apply to saving for a purchase. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Um, like Darren and Nikki said last night, I am not your Bible teacher, I'm not your Torah teacher, I don't claim that position, that's too much uh, pressure for me and I don't want to answer to the Father for that. But I do know that a lot of these scriptures, though they may have a deeper meaning, we can apply them to personal finance in our, in our day today. So we can look at this and see that planning for purchases, uh, planning diligently with our finances is going to benefit us in the future, otherwise we're going to start something, not be able to finish, have to go in debt, and then the ball starts rolling in the wrong direction. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. If we don't ever save, if we don't ever plan, if we don't ever um, get to the point to where we can purchase a homestead, have investments to leave behind if the market happens to be okay at that age, um, if we don't ever do that, we can't fulfill this, this scripture here that says a good man leaves an inheritance to their children's children. Because instead what we do is we leave a pile of debt. And if any of our descendants want to keep any of those things that we have with debt, they have to either pay them off or the state is going to take them away. So, you know, we, we really need to be a lot more diligent with our personal finances so that we can do something uh, more along the lines of leaving an inheritance. Proverbs 21, 20. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours all that he has. Just a basic general scripture to help you understand that saving is a necessary element to being wise with your finances. Spending. How to, how to spend, when to spend, and why to spend. How to spend. Proverbs 21.5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. How do we spend? We spend by using a budget, writing everything down on paper, on purpose, at the beginning of the month, before the month begins. If we're not making a plan for our money, I've, I've worked with so many people that I'll ask them, do you have a budget? Yeah, I've got a budget. Oh, can I see it? Well, it's in my head. That doesn't work. When it's in your head, you have no idea what's happening. You think you, you, think you do, and you know, a lot of us have been there. We've, me and my wife have been there as well. You think you know what's going on, but then you end up having no money, and you, you look at your income and you think, how come nothing's left? Am I really spending this money? And truthfully, yes, you are. You're spending that money on things that you're not planning for, things that you didn't expect to spend. It's just slipping through your fingers because you don't have a diligent plan. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. 
But if we have food and clothing, with these will we, will we be content. We will be content, excuse me. This is the how and why, or the when and why. Um, we, we need to spend based on things that keep us content. It's okay to enjoy some of the fruits of the labor. We've got a scripture here that I'll show you based on that. But um, at the same time, we need to be content with what we have. We don't need to go and splurge and get the nicest, newest, fanciest things, especially when we don't have the money to do so. If you've got the money to do so, and it's a small percentage of the amount of money that you have, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one to dictate whether or not you should have that nice car. That's completely up to you. That's between you and the Father. Because Ecclesiastes 5, 18 through 19. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one, un, which, with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that Elohim has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom Elohim has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of Elohim. So it's not wrong to enjoy some of the fruits of your labor, but toward the end of this, we're going to see that there's a major heart check that has to happen. We have to understand where to draw the line with personal finance because money magnifies. Whoever you are as a person, the more money you get, it magnifies that. So if you're super generous, it's going to magnify that. If you're bitter and, and resentful, it's going to magnify that. So we really have to figure out where to draw the line and, and do these heart checks. But at the same time, we can enjoy some of what we've worked so hard for. If we take it back to biblical concept of uh, homesteading, farming, right, produce, it's okay for a farmer to enjoy some of the fruit that he's grown. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's a line. We don't want to splurge it all. We don't want to blow it all, you know, so on and so forth. 1 Timothy 5 through 8, or 5, verse 8. Uh, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. This is why we spend. We spend to take care of our household, to provide for our household. Unfortunately, we live in a culture where we have to use monetary value, right? If, if we had it a different way, if we had it a more biblical way, that wouldn't be the case. But given the circumstances that we live in, we have to make sure that we are at least providing for our own household and doing the things that make us responsible and wise with the money that we uh, function with. Angles of attack. There's a war for your money. I know you guys have all, you've all noticed this throughout your lives. Everyone wants it. You work really hard to get it and everybody comes and asks for it. They throw up billboards in your face everywhere you go, all along the interstate, in the stores, all those things. Debt. <clears throat> this is one of the angles of attack. Huge crisis. There's $13.8 trillion in consumer debt. This is not nation to nation debt. This is household individual debt in America. This is an epidemic. It's crazy. Um, the average American household has 90 plus thousand dollars of debt, not including their mortgage. That's two cars, some credit cards, and a student loan that's been around so long you think it's a pet because you're never getting rid of it. It's just, it's just part of the household now. Um, with with uh, credit cards, Apple Pay, and one click, we get another angle of attack. One click is a, a thing that Amazon's done. I don't know if you guys have seen that. If you have Amazon Prime, you've already got all your payment information in there, your address, all those things. And when you go on, if you, if you see an item, it has a little button that says buy with one click. You touch the button, it's on its way to your house. The danger of this is, you see this right here, friction? Marketing agents, marketing agencies, uh, major corporations, they're really good at marketing. They may or may not be evil, I don't know. It may or may not be a conspiracy, I don't know. But what I do know is that the less friction that is between you and a purchase, the more likely you are to buy and the more you will spend. They know that. And so what do they do? They make it as easy as possible for you to spend your money. The ways that they do that are right here, amongst others. The problem is, especially with credit cards, we spend 12 to 20% more on purchases. This is something that's scientific. It's been studied by multiple universities. There's no uh, synapse that fires in your head that causes any kind of pain when you swipe a card or insert a chip. When you use paper money, when you use cash, it's in your hand, you see it, you've counted it, you know how much it is. You hand it to the clerk on the other side of the counter, they either give you some change back or they keep all that you gave them and you get an item. When you purchase with, a, with plastic, you insert your chip, you put your card back in your, in your thing, and then you get your stuff and you go. There's no activation in your brain that allows you to understand, I just spent money. 
And because of that, it's really easy to overspend 12 to 20% more. When McDonald's first started accepting credit cards in the early 2000s, they realized that people spend on average 50% more with a credit card than they do when they pay cash. Yeah, I'll get the, you know, whatever burger it is. I don't know what they sell anymore. I haven't eaten there in years. I'll get the whatever burger with the large fries, large drink, and ice cream too. But when you're handing over dollars, you're like, well, I'll get the egg McMuffin, whatever it is. We're a consumer nation. Um, everywhere in your face is marketing. Marketing, marketing, marketing. They sell, 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 and we buy, buy, buy. It works. They're good at what they do. But we, because that's another angle of attack, have to be prepared for that. We have to understand it, and we have to know how to defend it. Um, how many of you have a craft store in your location, like a Joann's, Michael's, something like that? My wife loves the craft store. We don't go there a lot, but even before we had kids, she's the type who collected art supplies. Um, so against my will, sometimes she'll drag me into the craft store, and we'll go look for something like hooks or you know, whatever she needs for the next project. And on the way out of the craft store, they snake you through candies, snacks, chargers, knickknacks, you know, whatever, a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need. And we think, you know, oh, that's cute. We look at everything on the way out. But to them, it's not a game. They're very serious. They're concerned with making money, and they're good at it. And so the more we understand these angles of attack, the more we can be prepared. It's kind of like identifying your enemy. Um, You'll walk out of there with expecting to get hooks and spend you know, $18 because you got whatever, your Gordettos and the whole bit. Um, giving, the other, the other use for money. I'm not going to, as I said, I'm not your Bible teacher. I'm not going to talk about the tithe. Um, I have my own opinions on that, but they're just that, opinions. I'm going to talk about just general giving. All throughout the scriptures, we're told to give to the poor, the widows, the orphans, and the sojourners. And the way that we do that is with cheerful generosity. Um, it's really hard to be cheerfully generous when you've got payments coming out of your ears and debt up to your eyeballs, and you're concerned with keeping the car, the house, or putting food on the table. How can you give when it's either I eat and feed my children, or I give? It makes it really difficult. And I'm not saying you can't do it, maybe you can, but it's a lot more difficult to be cheerful when doing so. Cheerful generosity in the scripture looks like Deuteronomy 15.10. You shall surely give to him, um, parenthetically I put the poor among you because that's the context. And your heart should not be grieved when you give to him because for this thing, Yah your Elohim will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand. Proverbs 22.9. He who has a generous eye will be blessed for he gives of his bread to the poor. Matthew 6, 3 through 4. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For Elohim loves a cheerful giver, and Elohim is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. That's what cheerful generosity looks like. It's, it's something that we do out of the gladness of our heart. It's not a reluctant thing. We just give, 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 because our needs are met. We're content with what we have. We've got some of our money going toward investing for, uh, let's say, to send our kids through some kind of education or help them start a business. And then we're saving something so that when we retire, we don't have to try to depend on the government or be a burden to family and friends. We can hopefully, if everything works out, depend on the money that we've diligently saved. If it doesn't work out that way, it's in the Father's hands. And if, let's say, the market crashes, we're going to have a lot bigger issues to think about, or if he returns, or whatever the case may be. So with personal finance, it's so much more about, num it's so much more about behaviors than number. Any, any kind of number, math, you know, uh, percentages, uh, rates of return, those, th those things really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. It's more so about behavior. And all the scriptures that apply to personal finance speak to behavior. So the first thing we have to understand with personal finance is that we are stewards. We own nothing. The Father owns it all. He gives it to any and everyone, whether they're good, wicked, Whatever his reasoning is, who knows? He's God, we're not, we're going to let him be God. 
But the, the point is, <clears throat> he, he allows us to manage the blessings that he gives us. But he owns it all. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, to Yah your Elohim belong heaven, uh, heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is Yah's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 89, 11. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in it, you have found in them. There's more scriptures that go on with the same type of concept of the gold and the silver belong to me, so on and so forth. It all belongs to him. So, because we're managers, let's take a look, a quick look at stewardship in action. Proverbs 24, 27. Prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. My opinion on this scripture and the way I view it within the realm of personal finance is we need to prioritize everything that we're doing. We need to prioritize resources, time, and efforts. If we're not prioritizing, we're going to tailspin out of control because we're not being diligent, we're not planning, we're not doing the things that help us uh, manage well. If your personal financial situation was a company and your boss said, I want you to manage the company finances and make sure that we don't lose a dime, we don't overspend anything. You would take that a lot more seriously and you would do a lot better at it than you may do in your own personal financial situation. That's how we need to treat our personal financial situation if we ever want to have any kind of financial peace. 1 Corinthians 4.2, moreover it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Very simple. Trusted with little, being found faithful. You guys have likely uh, been through these scriptures. This is um, some different examples of the same concept from the Messiah about being trusted with little and thus being given more. I'll read this one over here, Luke 19, 17. And he said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. When we're faithful with the little bit that he's giving us, he gives us more. But when we're not faithful with the little bit that he's given us, we're not going to sit there and ask him for more blessings. To do so is almost like trampling grace underfoot. It's, a, it's an idea of, yeah, I can go out and keep sinning and do whatever I want to do. It's all good. I've got grace. That doesn't work. We have to take the grace um, seriously, and we have to appreciate it by changing the way we live our lives. It's the same thing with personal finance. If we want to be given more to manage, if we... Um, desire to be any kind of leader in the community and be a, a, a place where people can find refuge or anything like that, we've got to be trusted with the little before he's ever going to give us more to manage. So this responsibility is very serious. Proverbs 27, 23 through 27. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does the crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will provide your clothing, and the goats the price of a field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and for the nourishment of your maidservants. So beyond just monetary paper money, um, something that we should really be striving toward is like what Darren and, and Nikki were saying last night, trying to get to the point of homesteading and have something sustainable that will provide for us in case of any kind of cri crisis, in case of you know, the, the American economy crashing or, or anything like that. But it's never going to happen when we're piling up a whole bunch of debt. It's never going to happen because if we're piling up a bunch of debt and the economy crashes and we lose our job, well, now we can't pay for anything and it all gets taken away because in actuality the bank owns it. So we have to be making wise decisions. Wise decision making looks like Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in Yah with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Even in personal finance, acknowledge the Father. Bring it to him. Show him what's going on. Ask him to lead you in managing well. Ask him to be a guide for you so that you can manage the way that his instructions say to. Proverbs ten seventeen, Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who ignores reproof goes astray. The Hebrew word here for instruction is not the word Torah. It's more of a general instruction. So, Whoever is listening and just stepping back and taking advice, taking it with a grain of salt, that person is on the path to life. Whether the advice is accurate or not, we need to heed any kind of instruction from any angle and test it to the scriptures to see if it's truly wise. Psalm twenty-seven, fourteen: Wait on Yah, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on Yah. 
All these things is how we make wise decisions. Serving Yah with our blessings. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor Yah with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst out with new wine. One good question is how do we serve God today with our blessings without having something like the priestly system or the temple or anything like that? And a practical example from the Messiah, I don't know how familiar you all are with this, but um, in context, the Messiah is saying when the king returns, he's going to say to the people on his right, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was in prison and you came and visited me. And the people on his right say, <clears throat> Master, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you a drink? When did we come and visit you in prison? And his response is this. And the king will, tell them, will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So the way that we can serve God with our blessings is by giving the way that we just learned to the poor, the widow, the orphan, the sojourner with a glad heart. If we do it to the least of everyone among us, we're doing it for God. And that's another way to look at it as opposed to just giving it to the person that you see right in front of your face. <clears throat> Diligence and commitment. We've got to be diligent in everything that we do. If we're not, again, if we're not planning, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, it gives us a little bit of wisdom. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. No one's going to do this for you. It's up to you. No one can help you change. No one can help you be more disciplined. It's up to you. So take, take it from the ant who doesn't have anyone ruling over them, but they definitely take care of their household and provide their food so that when any kind of famine or anything comes or it's too hot to be out there getting food, working, whatever, I'm not, I don't know a whole lot about ants, but uh, when that's the case, they've, they've got their food ready to go. Proverbs 16, 3, commit your work to Yah and your plans will be established. Commit everything you do to him and your plans will be established. The plans that we make with our money, commit it to him. Scripture's view on borrowing and debt. Here's the fun stuff. Here's the stuff that nobody wants to hear because it's kind of it's kind of dirty. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's uh, uncomfortable to see that we've been lied to on yet another thing. But if we truly want to have more freedom found in the scriptures, we've got to take the advice of the scriptures. We've got to live it out. Deuteronomy 15 and uh, 28, both those chapters, they quote this here that, uh, s that God tells the children of Israel, you'll lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. By design, when he took them out of slavery in Egypt in the Exodus and brought them into their own, their own land, he set them up in this way, saying, you can lend to all of them, but don't borrow from them. And I get a lot of pushback on this because people ask, well, if we shouldn't be borrowing from anyone, how come there's the year of release every seven years? And the answer is, the year of release is for brother to brother. Um, we are allowed to lend and borrow from another, um, one another, even though I don't recommend it. It's okay. It's, it's not as big of a deal. The reason is we all have rules to play by when we lend to and borrow from each other. If I borrow from Steve here, um, he cannot charge me any kind of interest, and my responsibility is to get back to him what I borrowed as quickly as possible like my life depends on it. If I go and borrow from the nations, they don't play by those rules, and they are now my master, and I have to do whatever they say or they're going to take something away from me, whatever I'm borrowing, they're going to sue me, the whole, the whole bit. Proverbs 22, 7 makes that really clear. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Another one that I get pushed back on. They'll say, oh, well, this word slave here is more along the lines of servant, and it's not wrong to be a servant, which is right. But at the same time, this is a negative connotation. We do not want to be servants to those of the nations. I'm not going to volunteer. I don't know about any of you, but I'm not going to volunteer to be Visa's servant. I'm not going to volunteer to be Best Buy's servant or GMC or whoever it is. If, if I'm volunteering to make them my master, I'm leaving my fate in their hands. Not something we should be doing. Proverbs 22, 26 through 27. Be not one of those who give pledges, who put up securities for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should your bed be taken from under you? A really basic look at borrowing and debt. If we have to borrow to have something, we can't afford it. So if we can't afford it, why should we go into debt for that item when we can't pay, they're going to take something away from us to get what they are owed. That's, that's the game that we're signing up for. You're playing with fire, and it's definitely not wise. Proverbs 13, 7 through 8. 
One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. There's some balance here that we have to kind of figure out. Um, when we see people out and we're comparing, uh, Darren and Nikki mentioned the Joneses last night. They're not keeping up with the Joneses anymore. The Joneses are broke, guys. Don't compare yourselves to them. They look really good, but if you go behind their door when they go to bed at night, they're broke, they're stressed, they're angry at each other, they're not happy because they've built this house of cards where they have a lot of things to keep some kind of status that they think they need to be somebody. And in reality, the bank owns every single thing they have. They have nothing. And if any kind of crisis comes into their lives, it's gone. It's all gone. They're exposed. Their dirty laundry is out in the open. We don't want to be that way. Um, I'm not saying you have to pretend. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to completely break down this scripture here and, and say what's going on. But um, <clears throat> the point is we don't want to pretend to look like something we're not. And when we're focused on having a lot of things that we can't afford, that's kind of the root behavior that's going on. We're concerned with looking a certain way or having a certain status or having certain luxuries even when we can't afford them. Myths and truths. We're going to talk about a few myths and truths behind these various different debts right here. Credit cards, cars, student loans, and mortgages. Credit cards. Myth. If you pay your credit card every month, if you pay it off, <clears throat> you're winning because you get the free use of someone else's money. The truth is you don't win with money when you use credit cards. 60% of everyone who uses a credit card doesn't pay it off on time. When we're using someone else's money to pay for things, we can't afford what we're trying to buy. Um, even if we can afford it and we think we're getting the use of someone else's money for certain perks, these perks that they, that they throw in our face, it's all just like we learned before. It's heavy marketing to get you to buy a product that they're selling. This product is not for your benefit. Their buildings are bigger than yours. Their furniture is nicer than yours. They're the ones making money, not you. If something like 1% cash back gets your attention, 1% cash back looks like $1,000 in your pocket after you spend 100000 So we just saw we spend 12 to 20% more with plastic. We're going to spend, 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 spend so we can get a perk. It doesn't make sense. It's not any kind of way to wealth. It's not use of free money. It's really debilitating you more than anything. With teenagers, a lot of parents think that they're uh, being responsible by getting their, their son or their daughter into a, a credit card to help them be financially responsible. But the problem is you're helping them be financially irresponsible because one, they're overspending, they're not practicing delayed gratification, they're not being content with their situation, they're just buying whatever their credit limit will let them buy. And number two, financial responsibility is not taught by a handout. Money comes from work. You don't work, you don't eat. If we're just giving kids money, you've got your credit limit, go and spend it you know, pay it back, don't pay it back, whatever. That's how, that's how society works. That's not financial responsibility. Cars. You can get a good deal on a new car with 0% interest. A new car loses 60% of its value in the first four years. That's not 0% interest. It's 0% interest on, uh, you know, on the face of the situation. It looks like a good idea. But when your car is losing that much value, you're throwing money away. No one would take $28,000 and invest it and lose $17,000 of it and think that that's a good idea. But that's what happens. A $28,000 car is going to cost, is going to lose you $17,000 of value in the first four years. That's $100 a week, guys. $100 a week. You're throwing it away. If anyone's comfortable doing that, um, I take donations. No, I, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, the average millionaire, which by the way, a millionaire is someone who has a net worth of a million dollars or more. A net, your net worth is what you own minus what you owe. So if you've got a mortgage of, let's say, $200,000, but you've got uh, $1,200,000 in an investment, the two balance out to put you at a million dollars, you are now a millionaire. This does not mean you make a million dollars a year. Most millionaires make actually like 60, 70,000 a year. They just diligently save and don't have any debt. The average millionaire drives a two to three year old car that's slightly used, they simply bought it with cash, and they're just unwilling to take the financial loss. Um, a pushback I get is, what about the warranty? You get, you, know, you get your warranty on a new car. If you want your car for the warranty and you're okay losing 60% of its value in four years for that, it doesn't make sense because, like we just saw, $17,000 is what you're losing on a $28,000 car. 
you could have rebuilt the car three or four times. The warranty doesn't make sense. That's not, that's not a wise decision. It's, a, it's something that they market that sells really well. It makes perfect sense, so we buy it. But we have to pay attention to the angles of attack and make sure that we're looking through them with wisdom. Student loans. To go to college, you'll have to get a student loan. The truth is, one can go to college on scholarships and or by paying cash. I get a, I get a crazy stare when I tell people they can pay cash for college. But it comes down to making the right decisions of going to an in-state school, getting a major that is sufficient to the marketplace, you know, all these different types of things. Um, with scholarships, there's $3 billion per year in unclaimed scholarships. Every single year. If you've got teenagers that are looking in to go to college, um, get them applying for scholarships immediately like it's a job. This is free money that, that's not being claimed for people to go to school because it's a little bit more difficult. It's easier to just sign the dotted line and go through school and, and think about paying it back later. Better grades uh, when you work part-time is some studies that have been done by multiple universities. If you work part-time throughout college, you start to learn a lot more things like discipline, time management, etc., and you don't have time to, to clown off, and so you get better grades. You take, it more, um, you take it more seriously being at college. You don't just use your downtime to party. Savings options. One more way to get through college without loans is parents, if you have young kids and you've got some time to save for them, there's some um, educational savings accounts that you can start to, to save into to help them get through college. You don't even have to put a lot in there. If you can help grow some money for them over time with your budget willing, uh, allowing you to do that, then that's another option for your kids to go to college without debt. It can be done. There's a lot more details to it than this, but it can be done, and many people do it. So many people graduate debt-free. But on the other hand, so many people graduate with 30 plus thousand dollars of debt. These are young adults with little to no job experience who are trying to get out on their own and they've got this huge debt weighing over them. And <clears throat> if they're thinking about going and getting married and being in a relationship, now you can multiply it by two because they both went to college and it just creates so much more stress in the marriage at the very beginning. It's a terrible situation to be in and we've got to avoid it. Mortgages. What about buying a house? Myth, you need a mortgage to buy a house, and to get a mortgage, you need credit. I'm a huge proponent of the 100% down plan. Um, when you're younger, this is really feasible. Even when you're older, it's still feasible. It's not nearly as hard as it seems when you start to get responsible, when you start to follow the principles that the Bible instructs us to follow. When we're diligent, when we know where all the money is, when we're content, we're not overspending, we can have a lot of extra money when we're working very hard. All these types of things are what get us to the point of being able to do the 100% down plan. Um, if I can't talk someone out of a mortgage, though, it's still a myth that you can only get a mortgage with a, credit, uh, a high credit score or any credit score at all. Um, if you're going to get a mortgage and I can't talk you out of it, you can do that with a zero credit score. Your credit score goes to indeterminable once you have no debt for six months to a year. The, the credit bureaus just say, okay, indeterminable credit, indeterminable credit score, zero, These person don't, this person doesn't have a credit score. If you go to a, a mortgage company who does manual underwriting, which is the old way that they used to write mortgages, they look at the details of your life. They look at, can you afford the loan that you're trying to take out based on your income? Have you had a steady job for several years? Do you pay your landlord on time? Do you pay your utilities on time? All those types of details are what manual underwriters look at to determine whether or not you can take out the loan that you're trying to take out. Again, I never advise that, but if I can't talk you out of it, don't focus on building up your credit score and overspending, getting yourself into heaps and mounds of debt just to get your mortgage. There's another way you can do it. Taking advantage of American freedom, in quotes, because we're free, but we're not free. Um, we've got to take advantage of what's available to us to function well in this society if we're going to avoid debt. So avoiding debt is crucial, but it's never going to happen if we don't follow the right procedures that are given to us, allotted to us in this nation. Um, that comes down to having adequate insurances, having emergency savings, having some kind of sustainability, um, trying to be self-employed, doing something to provide income where you're not depending on someone else's company or someone else's, you know, if, if your boss decides to have a bad day and uh, screw up the company or treat you bad, you're not depending on that and then profitable investments, whether or not they last in the future. This is what's going to help us avoid debt. If we have adequate car, adequate car insurance, 
it's going to help us stay out of debt. If we have adequate medical insurance, it's going to help us stay out of debt. Really pretty simple. Hard work. We are designed to work. Even before the fall of man, we were created to work. God makes man right away, puts him in the garden, and says, work the garden. Um, <clears throat> we are created in the image of our Father, who is a creator, a designer, and that's our nature. Our nature is to design, to create, to work, to serve one another. It's okay to make income doing so. When we're working hard, the Proverbs are abundantly clear of the byproduct that happens. Proverbs 6, 10 through 11, and also 24, 33 through 34 say the exact same thing. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. If we're sleeping, if we're slumbering, if we're being lazy, we're folding our hands, we're going we're gonna to step into poverty. Proverbs 10, 4. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the, of the diligent is richly supplied. Proverbs 14, 23. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Proverbs 20, 13. Love not sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes, and you will have plenty of bread. Super simple. Don't sleep, don't be lazy, don't waste your time. The only time we should be resting are the Sabbaths and the high Sabbaths. Other than that, we're designed to work. We're created to work. If you don't like what you do, you live in America. No one is forcing you to do something you don't like to do. Figure out what you like to do and find out how to make money from it. We can make money doing anything in this, in this country. Anything. People pay for the dumbest lyrics on the face of the earth. They'll pay you to do something that's actually valuable. They'll, they will. So do that. Do it with all, all, of, all that you can. Um, we're taught in Scripture to work as if we're working for the Father himself. In everything that you do, do it as if you're doing it for him. Wealth and riches. Wealth and riches are a byproduct of what we just talked about, hard work. The Proverbs make it clear. You work hard, you're abundantly enriched. That's, that's just how it works. But with that is the balance of everything else that we've talked about making sure that we're managing right, making sure that we're found faithful with li the little that he's giving us. But this is a byproduct. Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of Yah makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. If your riches, if your wealth are from God, there's no sorrow attached. People say more money, more problems. What they really mean is, I got a higher income, and I got into more debt, so I have a lot more problems. But if we're following God's instructions, when we make more money, we do the right things with it. We put some of it away for our children. We give a lot of it away. We save it for emergencies, all these types of things. And there's no sorrow attached. Personal finance doesn't have to be sorrowful. In six years of marriage, my wife and I have not had a single money fight. And again, that's not to brag, but that's the type of peace that you can have in your household if you're just simply following biblical instruction with your personal finances. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Again, a byproduct of gathering little by little and not being hasty and decision-making and work and, you know, cutting corners and all those types of things, a byproduct is wealth. It just happens. It's not wrong to be wealthy, but we have to draw the line. This is very important that we draw the line because, like I said at the beginning, money magnifies. It magnifies who you are. It magnifies your character. It's more about behavior than anything else. So the way we draw the line, there's several scriptures I'm going to go through right here. Um, I guess about 15, so, so buckle up for a minute. <laughs> Proverbs 1, 19. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. The context of this, right before Solomon writes this, he talks about how um, people who are wicked essentially dig their own grave. Same thing. The ways of everyone who, who are greedy for gain is the exact same. It takes away the life of its owner. So don't be greedy. Draw the line. Proverbs 10.2. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. Money is for nothing other than surviving in this current system that we live in. That's it. That's it. Money is not wicked. Money is not wrong. Money is not good. It's amoral. It's just a tool. It's a tool that you build with. That's it. It does not profit you whatsoever in the day of wrath. 
Righteousness is what does that. Proverbs 11.4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Same concept. Proverbs 11.28, whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. We don't trust in riches. We trust in the Father who gives the riches, right? We don't trust in the blessings. We trust in the one who gives the blessings. Proverbs 15, 16. Better is a little with the fear of, of Yah than great treasure and trouble with it. If you can't have any kind of excess, it's better to have very little but still trust in Yah and fear Him. Proverbs 21, 6. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. Draw the line. Don't do things that compromise your integrity and your morals to get money, to get wealth, to, to do anything like that. Proverbs 21, 17. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. The love of money. The root of all evil is the love of money, not money. It's not just money that's evil. It's the love of it. And whoever loves it, you're going to be poor. You're going to squander every single thing that you have and make. Proverbs 22, 1 through 4. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. The reward for, hu for humility and fear of, of the Lord is riches and honor and life. It's better to choose integrity. It's better to choose in character than anything else and to fear the Father. Proverbs 23, 4 through 5. Do not toil. Um, I've added some parentheses here. Exhaust yourself to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to know when to. Desist, which means to abstain. When your eyes light on it, it is gone, for suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Don't, don't work yourself to the point of exhaustion and... You go home and you have no energy to give your family because you're working so much to gain wealth. If you've got to do that to get yourself out of debt and to provide for your household, that's a different story. Um, because in Proverbs 6, uh, Solomon tells us that we need to not sleep at all if we owe anyone money. We need to pay it back like our life depends on it, like the gazelle getting away from the hand of the hunter. The gazelle's main hunter is the cheetah. It gets away because its life actually depends on getting away. One of those animals is getting lunch, the other one's trying to survive. So if we have debt, if we need to provide for our family, if you know, we have bad circumstances, then yes, it's okay to work like this. But to gain wealth, that's not okay. We have to draw the line. Proverbs 28, 6. Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Proverbs 28, 20. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Um, I've done a lot of thinking about this. The, the, punish, the punishment here is not always a direct punishment from the Father. The more I've worked with people and the more I've seen um, those who are, are trying to get rich very quickly, they're trying to cut corners, they're trying to do whatever makes the most money, um, not thinking about the decision and just jumping right into it, not being diligent, their life is a series of, of punishments that they've created for themselves. Losing houses, losing businesses, losing everything, ending up on the street, because they're so concerned with making money that they jump right into a deal without you know, carefully weighing the options and taking it to the Father to establish the plan. This is a major issue, so we, don't wanna, we wanna draw the line and not be um, trying to be hasty and get rich. First Timothy 6, 6 through 10, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food, clothing, food and clothing with these, will we be content? But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. When we're trying to get rich and we're not being content with what we have, with what the Father has given us, when we're overspending especially more than what we even have, going in debt to do so. Um, we're being ruled by those types of decisions and behaviors. This is something that the body should not be doing. And, and unfortunately, the body is not exclusive from the same problems that the rest of America faces. We all have the exact same financial problems because we've all been trained in the exact same society. And we all just kind of follow until we start to wake up. First Timothy 6, 17. 
As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Our hope lies in the Father, not what he gives us. Acts 8, 17 through 22. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of, the wicked, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. The intent of our heart is what matters when it comes to personal finance. Money, again, does not do anything other than provide for our household, maybe leave something behind to our children, and get us out of tight situations. That's all it does. It doesn't do anything like getting us gifts of God or saving us from wrath. The, the entire concept behind everything that we've just talked about as I wrap up is we don't just get out of debt to get out of debt. If, if that's what you're doing, if that's what you think is going to work, you're going to go right back into debt. You have to have a so that. Getting out of debt so that I can homestead. Getting out of debt so that I can homeschool, so I can have time with family, so that I can go on missions and not be begging everyone for money because I can't survive even though I've made the choice to go and serve. Um, so that I can have some dignity when I retire. So that I can have financial peace in my household because of the system that we live in. Um, our flesh is not, it's not our nature to be disciplined. Our, our flesh wants to be impulsive, our flesh wants to act out, and it's a constant war, as we see from the scriptures, between spirit and flesh. We have to contain the flesh and we have to make discipline happen. We have to take control of our destiny. We have to choose. We're given the ability to do so. The power of choice is a huge power and something we have to take very seriously. So the last scripture I have here is Proverbs 11, 24, 25. One gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessings will be enriched and one who waters will himself be watered. That's the so that. Get out of debt, be financially free, have peace so that you can richly and freely give. That's what it's all about. Thank you guys so much for your time.